Chat with Traders, episode 92. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. This episode is sponsored by Tradovate. Tradovate is the first ever commission-free futures brokerage. Now, I know this almost sounds too good to be true, right? So you're probably asking, what's the catch? Well, as a customer, you will need to pay one flat monthly rate, which starts from a very reasonable $39. This enables you to trade as often as you want and as many contracts as you want and eliminates all per trade commissions. To experience what it's like to be a Tradovate customer, go to tradovate.com forward slash traders now and sign up for a free two-week demo. That's tradovate.com forward slash traders. All right. Hey team, what's up? How you doing? Uh, just before I even introduce you to my guest this week, I want to say real quick, thanks to everyone who made it out to the first ever Chat with Traders get together on the weekend here in Brisbane. It was good fun and really awesome to meet a bunch of you in person. I actually hope to do something similar in Sydney and Melbourne sometime soon too. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that briefly, but for this episode, I spoke with Dario Mofardin. For some background on Dario, he went from a finance degree straight into a market analyst and then trader position at a private global macro hedge fund. He then went into investment banking for 13 years, working with mergers and acquisitions from various locations around the globe. And since 2008, Dario has been trading independently, but has recently begun trading external funds also. Some of the things we chat about during this episode include how to build a body of evidence, seeing the whole board as a global macro trader, why Dario went from short-term trading to higher timeframes, plus trade management and trader checklists too. Full show notes for this episode can be found at chatwithtraders.com forward slash 92. Right, well, that's enough from me. Please welcome Dario Mofardin. I mean, Dario, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's I've been looking forward to this to quite some time. I mean, last time we spoke, it was snowing down at your place. So I presume that's all cleared up by now. <laughs> yeah, it has. Unfortunately, it looks like the ski season is pretty much over. Ah, right, right. Do you do much skiing? Uh, when I can, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's Actually, why I moved up here. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Um, I was just scrolling through your Twitter feed before we jumped on the call and I saw you posted a pic um, quite recently. Um up skiing somewhere <laughs> so of course that was up at thread though that was the uh the pre yelling uh market chopping so. okay <laughs> nice nice well anyway we've got plenty to discuss so let's just jump right into it um i'd really like to start with how you came into trading like share with us a little bit about your introduction to this business where did everything kick off for you okay um i guess my real introduction to trading was straight out of university. I did a business finance degree and my first real job, I suspect, um, was with a private investment house called Portland House Corporation. They're a family-run, family office, effectively a hedge fund based in Melbourne. So the owner, David Haynes, and the Haynes family run that business. So I was recruited out of university as a market analyst slash trader for them. So that was my first taste of trading. Um, the way they go about their business is they effectively a global macro hedge fund. So that was my introduction to the people they invested in, like the George Soros's of this world, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Um, they also gave me, I guess that was my first exposure to understanding uh, global macro overlay and then understanding um, technical analysis to trade those global macro views. Um, they were followers of Robert Prechter, who was who's kind of the the godfather of Elliott Wave, and that was my first introduction to kind of the Elliott Wave theory, how to apply it, uh, the philosophy behind it, um, and the idea of 
herding and market behavior. So that really resonated with me. I'm quite visual, so charts to me and pattern recognition makes sense. Um, and to have that price overlay over a macro view, I think, uh, was a great introduction. So I worked for Portland House for about two years, um, did my MBA in Melbourne as well. And after that, I actually left trading um, to become an investment banker. So I worked in mergers and acquisitions for about, I guess that was from about 95 till 2008. So 13 years I worked in mergers and acquisitions. And the reason I did that was really to get a broader perspective of markets, global finance. Um, it really gave me a good insight into how the capital markets actually worked, the nuts and bolts of uh, raising equity, raising debt, um, M&A transactions, and it got me, enabled me to see the world. So I wor worked in, you know, Sydney, New York, Singapore. So it gave me an opportunity to really understand how the decision makers went about running their businesses. Um, so I advised um, a bunch of kind of corporates and um, governments as well. So that gave me an idea and an understanding of how they make decisions in kind of the, in the global markets. So that was a great learning for me. Um, you know, I worked mostly at Morgan Stanley and also at uh, Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers. So that gave me a great understanding of how the markets and how the world worked. So that was, so after initially trading for a couple of years, did that for about 13 years and then decided to start my own trading business full time. So that was in 2008. Right. Okay. So let's pull that apart a little more. I mean, just going right back to the very beginning there, when you did your, your finance degree, I mean, what actually, why did you choose to do a finance degree? You had Was getting involved in markets always something that you wanted to do from a, from a younger age or was it just kind of a last minute decision? No, it's something I've always had a passion for the markets and it actually started um, just as I finished high school. A friend of mine whose father uh, was a trader and so I think at the, as soon as I was old enough to open a broking account at the age of 18, I basically started trading. And we were trading, you know, penny stocks, we were trading futures, um, not really knowing what we were doing. But I guess the fascination with, for me was really understanding how the global markets worked. So that was at the ripe old age of 18. So that focused me on what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to do, and that was do a finance degree to upscale my learning um, and really understand um, how the markets worked. So to me, it was always an intellectual exercise, I guess, at, at first, just trying to solve what I think is the, you know, the three-dimensional chessboard, which is global financial markets. So that was my you know, first introduction trading for myself, not really know what I was doing, making all the mistakes that a new trader does. But um, it gave me a real taste for and a passion for the market, which I've had ever since. And it was interesting, one of my um, finance lecturers was an ex-bond trader. Um, and uh, so that was, we, we would talk every day just about markets and his experiences and his learnings. And, uh, and he was the one who actually got me introduced to Portland House in terms of once I graduated um, to actually apply and to learn even more. All uh, right. Okay. So, so what sort of success did you see in that first you know, year or two when you were trading penny stocks and a, a whole bunch of futures as well? How did you do? Did you do all right or was it a bit of a fail? Well, I did actually really well. Um, and I'm not sure if it was luck or whatever it was, but um, I actually for the first couple of years, did very well. I joined Portland House and I actually um, had a very good track record. They initially hired me as a market analyst and within six months promoted me to a trader to trade uh, the SPY here in Australia and also FX. So I actually built quite a strong track record um, and they quickly identified they had good risk management. I could read the markets really well and um, actually built up quite a good track record there. Okay, and just so I understand that right, your track record that you had built up, that was in those first six months you are working with the firm or in your um, personal trading before you started with them? Uh, both. 
So I did quite well trading for myself and then with the firm did very well in building up. I had an allocation to, um, given to me back at, back at the time when I first started and um, my returns are very strong. Okay, so what was your thought process before you joined this firm? Like when you were trading the penny stocks and futures, I'm just trying to get an idea of how you like first started out approaching markets. Like what was your thought process for deciding which penny stocks or which futures you were going to trade? Um, it was all chart based and it was all pattern recognition based. So I didn't have a formal platform to learn from. Like I didn't have like the structure I've developed since then. But it was really chart-based analysis in terms of support resistance, um, following the trend, very, very simple. Um, but the advantage was at the time we're in a bull market. So, you know, I participated in a lot of uh, junior IPOs and it seemed very, very easy money to make. And it was because we're in a bull market and I never went short. I was always long and so the mark I was on the right side of the market. I'm not sure how... Um, that system would survive over time. But uh, it just happened to be fortuitous. We were in a very strong bull market at the time. Okay, yeah. So how did your how did your finance degree set you up for when you started working at the private fund? Like to what extent was that useful or unuseful in any way? It was useful in terms of uh, the finance courses, understanding financial products, understanding the flow of capital, understanding global macroeconomics. Um, so all of those learnings assist you in terms of understanding how the world works. Now, from my perspective um, at the moment, you know, I'm a global macro discretionary trader. So I start with a thesis of where I think the global macro environment is. You know, what are the key drivers? Um, at the moment, you know, it's, it's the Fed and so forth. But doing the degree helps you build a background in understanding what are futures, what are the FX markets, how interest rates in different countries impact currencies, um, and the relationship between, you know, currencies or the bond markets and the equity markets. So getting a basic understanding and a, a formal education is to how different products and different flow of capital worked, I think was very advantageous. It gave me a strong foundation of actually understanding how markets worked. Okay, okay. And then, so you, so you just started this private fund, uh, you had your finance degree. Was there any sort of training provided by the fund you'd started at? Did they, did they teach you the ropes, um, I guess, more on the, on the trading front in any way? Yeah, and that was more um, learn by doing and learn by observing. So I got to work with um, Stephen Haynes, who was the founder's son, who was a very, who was a bond trader for many years. And so just seeing how he operated and seeing how, um, as being part of the investment management committee, understanding how decisions were made and understanding you know trade risk reward uh, risk management. Um, and really being disciplined around that aspect. That's what I really learned there. And it wasn't a formal education as such. It was more education through observing and seeing how they went, went about doing their business. Yeah, yeah, okay. Up until this point, it sounds as though your, your trading path had been quite smooth sailing, um, if, you, if you want to call it that. Were there, was there anything that was particularly challenging for you, was there any obstacles you had to overcome up until this point? Um, not really. I think I was quite fortunate in the markets I was trading and and I seemed to have a reasonably natural uh, intuition about uh, pattern recognition and observing the markets and a good understanding of kind of how things worked. The real education for me came when I went actually started trading for myself and that was the realization of um, hubris not real realizing that you're you know doesn't always go your way and when you're actually trading your own money the um, the psychological aspects around that um, and trading for a business I think that was where 
you know, you st I started to be more aware of the challenges. And I was quite fortunate in my first year of trading for myself. I had a stellar year and, um, and that set me up very well. And, you know, the pride comes before the fall because the next year I pretty much gave most of it back because, you know, you think you know a lot more than you do. Um, you trade too aggressively and too much size. So that was the real start of my education, I think. My real trading education about position sizing, risk management, um, your own psychology and really understanding the nuts and bolts of trading. So you went out trading on your own as in set up like a proper business to trade for yourself. I think that was around 2008. I think you, you actually mentioned that earlier. Yes. Um, up until that point, like obviously between leaving the fund uh, and starting to trade for yourself as, as a, your own trading business, uh, you were an investment banker. I mean, what, what sparked the decision to, to leave the fund and go work as an investment banker? Where'd that come from? I think the reality was um, I was quite young when I was at the fund, so I was in my early 20s. And I felt while successful, I felt like I was just going to the casino every day. And I don't generally gamble. So to me, it just, I guess the best way to put it was that, you know, I needed some more, I guess, grounding in what I was doing because it felt like I was basically at the casino punting every day. And while successful, there was not that satisfaction as in terms of, you know, understanding why you were doing a good job, understanding why you're actually good at this. So what I wanted to do, and I did an MBA because I wanted to get a deeper grounding in the fundamentals of capital markets and the fundamentals of decision making. So that was the main reason I went to investment banking and to get a real formal education and formal real life experience in how the markets worked, you know, how the capital markets are created, how they operate um, and how the decision makers work. Because I think that and working with um, clients such as, you know, Gillette, Schlumberger, KKR, these guys, it really gives you insight as to how decisions are made from the corporate level and that obviously flows into how the capital markets operate. Okay. And now having done 13 years as an investment banker and having worked with, you know, these clients you mentioned, did that make you realize and, and answer the questions that you were asking? Like, um, or answer the questions, answer the questions that you were asking as in like, you know, you didn't really understand why you were good as a trader, why why you were successful at it. Did that answer those questions? It went to some degree, yes. And to some degree, it was about um, just gaining your own confidence and getting a formal education as to seeing why you saw what you saw. Um, so, yeah, it did. But the real education, as I said before, really starts when you actually trade and you trade full-time for yourself or for someone else um, and really um, it's where the rubber hits the road, I think, and that's where the real education comes into it. So was it required? Probably not, but it certainly um, helped doing things like just building your own experience base but also help build you know, the, the advantage of being in that industry is it helps you build a capital base where you can go out on your own, have your risk capital and be able to trade. So tell us about what you're doing today. You know, you started your own trading business in 2008. What exactly does that look like? What does that involve? Um, are you trading outside money? Um, give us a bit of a rundown on, on what you're doing today. Well, for the first seven years, I was just trading my own money and, um, you know, global macro discretionary trading. Uh, about two months ago, I set up an incubator fund. So I am now trading external money, external capital. Um, it's a small fund, but it's really about, it's, it, it's for um, professional sophisticated investors and institutional investors. So I now trade external money. Um, the fund itself is a global macro discretionary fund. Um, it trades, I trade, you know, futures, commodities, foreign exchange, bonds. And it's really about leveraging my edge, which I think over time, it's really about 
the ability to synthesize global macro themes combined with market analysis and a price overlay to really create um, great risk reward setups. And to do that, knowing that and built an experience over time, knowing that markets are probabilistic, so you need strong risk management. So that's that's what I'm doing today. Absolutely. We're going to dig into that much more very soon. I just, I'm curious though, what led to the decision to take on investors' money? Um, the real decision was around wanting to, it's leverage, wanting to build leverage. So um, while I was very comfortable trading my own money, I wanted to actually experience trading outside capital. Um, and the main reason is because I think I have quite a, a talent at doing this. So to be able to leverage that in size, um, it will enable me to build up capital base, which will enable me ultimately to build my own hedge fund. So that's that's the reason behind it. And the reason you set up an incubator fund is really to get build the track record, build it over time. It's um, auditable. It's um, clear for everyone to see the results, and it makes you accountable. And I like the idea of it being accountable and being transparent. Totally. Now that's a, that's a really good answer. And um, you know, I'm always interested in the reasons why people want to sort of scale up their their trading business. So I, I really like that you're doing that. Um, Hopefully, I'll be in a position to do that one day also. <laughs> um, so, you know, you've described this fund as being a global macro discretionary fund. I mean, if you could, could you just dumb it right down and explain exactly what that means? I guess just sort of summarize the type of trader you are today. Like, like what is that? What's that look like as a trading methodology? Okay. Um, I guess the best way to put it, global macro. So, you start with a top-down investment thesis. Now, whether that is um, a Fed-driven or um, interest rate-driven or currency-driven thesis or whatever your um, basis for understanding how the capital markets work, whether it's demographics, um, basically a big picture of where we are in the world and that and understanding where the risks are and therefore where the opportunities are. So I start with a top-down macro approach, you know, global capital flows, where the markets are heading, what they've been doing. And then I overlay that on what I call um, building a body of evidence. So you create a, a big picture thesis and then you build a body of evidence with charts, with analysis. And I use primarily Elliott Wave theory, um, Fibonacci clusters, multiple time frames, um, and combine that with into market analysis. What I often tweet and tell people who who I speak to regarding training, it's all about, for me, it's about seeing the whole board. And by that I mean understanding, you know, getting a whole picture in your head as to where the markets are in terms of interest rates, currencies, equity markets and commodities. And building that awareness of where the markets are I think enables you to trade where the flows are heading rather than where they've been. And in terms of how I trade, it's um, it's really about. And I think it was Stan Druckenmiller basically said, you know, the way to build long-term returns is through firstly preservation of capital and home runs. Now, historically, I was much more of a short-term trader. Um, but over the last kind of 12 to 18 months, I have morphed myself into a more position trader and swing trader where you leverage into positions where you, where all the stars align. So the whole idea is waiting for the fat pitch, not taking every trade, um, making sure that you are patient and you sit in the batter's box and you wait for the fat pitch. And when you see that, and all the stars align and the macro is supportive and the charts are supportive, then you lean heavily into a trade. Okay, let me jump in here to give a quick mention for our sponsor, Tradovate. Tradovate are a futures brokerage like no other. They've recognized that there's a better, more efficient and cost-effective way that traders and brokers can work together. 
For starters, Trader Vate does not charge their customers commission every time they trade because they're a commission-free broker. Customers pay a single flat rate membership for unlimited trading and full usage of their proprietary platform. It's really pretty simple. Now, if you're wondering where Trader Vate came from and who's behind the scenes here, Trader Vate's team has decades of experience in financial technology and they've worked in leading roles with big name brokers you'd be all too familiar with. So please know this isn't their first rodeo. For everything you need to know about Tradovate, visit tradovate.com forward slash traders. When you get there, sign up for a free two-week demo and give them a shot. Like I've said previously, if you've got any questions, just hit up their support team. I know they'd be more than happy to answer your questions. So please visit tradovate.com forward slash traders now. Tradovate being spelt T-R-A-D. O-V-A-T-E. Thanks so much for listening and supporting the podcast, guys. Let's jump back to the interview with Dario. Okay, so would you mind explaining a little more as to your reasons why you were, uh, for, for most of your career, being a short-term trader, but you know, in the, in the past couple of years, you've, as you described it, morphed into becoming more of a longer term trader where you're now swinging trades and you know taking position trades um why did you leave the short-term trading behind i was reasonably successful at short-term trading um but what i found it did it actually distracted from the bigger picture money making opportunities so you would become so absorbed in the short term and you're taking short-term swings and you're following all the rules that everyone tells you, so you know you don't risk more than one percent of your capital in every trade. Um, you take profits as early as you can, and and you basically grind your way through trading. And I think it was uh, Jack Lydell, who you've interviewed before, who said, you know, that it's the concept of the grinders, where you, you're trying to just grind out money every day. And what I found was, while that was reasonably successful, what it the downside is it took your focus away from the real money-making opportunities and that is where you see and my analysis and my the way I think about markets is you see major turning points and the ability to leverage and to really lean into those turning points because you go from grinding away and you kind of make percent here or a couple of percent there and you lose a percent here and you're kind of just incrementally growing your account versus seeing an opportunity where and accepting that the reality is, you know, a handful of trades make 90% of your income for the year. So you end up with a trading system, which I am more comfortable, which I found I was more comfortable at, which was leaning into strong conviction trades. And then what ends up happening is you make far more, but the returns are lumpier. So, you know, 90% of your profits come from 10% of your trades, which is, you know, a very different approach to trading. So that actually, what I felt was that people often talk about trade your personality. Uh, that was the realization where that, that was my personality. That suited how I looked at the markets. It suited how I traded and it suited my objectives, my trading objectives. Okay, and part of the reason for this realization, do you think that you were initially always looking at the bigger picture, but you were trading very short-term trades? Yes, <laughs> yes. That, that's, so it ends up being not wasted as such because you're still trading the markets as such, but what you're doing is you're, you're, you're trading the first 5% of a move and you're missing... Uh, the bigger picture because I've never really been a trend follow trader I've always been more of a contrarian uh, counter cyclical or um, counter trend trader because that also suits my personality when the herd is running one way I am more than often um, trading on the other side of that so that's where I you know I'm like most people who trade trend traders and so forth I am often on the other side so um, I like it when people are leaning into one side of a trade and I like the opportunity set when I get the right setup to go against that. Do you mind just explaining that a little more? I mean, this is something we often hear and I, I think especially for newer traders, that's probably 
a little bit confusing and sounds quite strange because obviously when the herd's running one way and price is moving, let's say it's moving up, you're looking for a short opportunity. Is that is that what you're getting at there? Yeah, and it's about when the trend is extended. Now, you don't do that in the middle of a trend, and that's where Elliott Wave helps me in terms of, and the work I do with commitment of traders, the work I do with intermarket analysis is look for trend exhaustion. So the idea is to create a structure and a price structure where you identify exhaustion points and key market reversals. Um, when the traders are looking in the wrong looking the wrong way. So it's not about shorting for the sake of being short. It's not about, you know, going long in a declining market just because you want to be counter cyclical. It's more about identifying where the opportunities are, how the traders are positioned, and what do the charts tell you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're more sort of looking at points where there's a there's a high probability or you you're anticipating the trend is exhausted and there's a turning point that may be uh, about to come in correct okay now something just going back to your response um, from a couple minutes ago you you described the longer term approach as giving you lumpier returns can you just explain why that's the case like why that happens um, the reason it happens is because waiting for the fat pitch, the trades don't come along very often. It's only a handful of trades a year for me, for example. Um, and in the meantime, I do a fair bit of shorter term trading just to keep keep in the flow of the market and keep keep the P&L clicking over. The reason it's lumpy is because when I see an opportunity that I really want to lean into, you add to the opportunity, you actually pyramid into the trade, which ends up increasing your exposure. So as markets become more volatile, as as the position gets bigger, you end up getting lumpier trades, lumpier P&L. So you, you continue to manage your risk to an X percent of your capital. But what you'll find is as you moving into a trade and as, you, as it develops, you're actually adding to it, pyramiding, and that creates more volatility in your P&L. Because the, the corollary to that is you do smaller trades, you take profits, you take it takes very small losses, and you just your P and L is far more stable because you're not taking as much risk. Okay, so just so we're really clear about how you're trading, what is your your typical hold time for you know any given trade that you might take uh, you know these days? So position sizing, uh, so pos- position trades are usually weeks to months and shorter term trades or swing trades are usually days, days to weeks. So it's very, very rare nowadays that I do an intraday trade. Okay. All right. Well, let's narrow in on Elliott Wave. I mean, this is something that we haven't really discussed on the podcast uh, in the past and, you know, I know it makes up a big part of your trading Talk to us about what does Elliott Wave show you? Like, what's the what's the purpose of using this particular form of analysis? It creates for me a framework for our, how I think and it, what resonates with me of how the market actually moves, and the market moves in waves. So, the concept of Elliott Wave is really about motive waves and corrective waves. So, basically, the trend. Which way is the trend and where are the corrections or the counter trend moves? So Elliott Wave helps you identify <coughs> the bigger picture trend. So maybe the best example is to go through how I think about it. You start with monthly charts, then I go to weekly charts, daily charts, just to try get an understanding of what the bigger picture trend is. Now Elliott Wave and I guess everyone's interpretation of reading a chart, you speak to five Elliott Wave and you probably get five different answers, but that's where you have to rely on your own analysis and your own work and confirming um, technicals, I guess. So the advantage of Elliott Wave to me is understanding when the market's in a corrective pattern or whether it's in a motive pattern, when it's actually trending. So that 
identif identifying how the waves are structured and how the market is behaving helps you understand of what position that individual market is in. Is it trending? Is it just consolidating? Um, and where are the opportunities? So what Elliott Wave helps you do is there are some basic rules around it. It provides very clear kind of points of ruin where the trade's wrong. It provides upside targets using Fibonacci relationships and so forth, which I use a lot of, Fibonacci extensions, retracements, and identifying target clusters. Um, but really about identifying where the trade is wrong, where are the upside targets, and how the market should be behaving to get there. And, you know, is the market chopping around? Is it actually trending? Is it basing? Um, these are all kind of important aspects to how I execute trades. And Elliott Wave helps me identify, um, I guess, the, the trend, the bigger picture trend. Okay, so the actual waves of Elliott Wave – what does that refer to? Like, what is a wave? Like, how would you, this? I know this might be a little bit tricky to describe without uh, some visual aid, but <laughs> yes, what is a wave? What, like, what's that actually referring to? A wave is the directional price movement. So, if the market is moving in a direction, say it's trending upwards, and it doesn't overlap, um, you have a clear price movement in a direction where there are gaps between support and resistance, there are constant breaks. Um, that will give you an indication, and it's very hard to explain without visual aids. Um, and then you've got a corrective pattern, which is a pause in a trend, which is where prices will be overlapping, there are no clear structures. Um, it's basically more choppy, I guess is the best description I can come up with. Okay, and the, I mean, just the the little bit I know about Elliott Wave, which is very little. Um, I believe the the number of waves in a certain direction has some sort of significance. Uh, could you shed a little light on that? So, the primary basis is five waves up and three waves down to establish a trend. So, if the market's moving in a direction in five waves, which It'd be easy to show you if I had some visual aids, and it consolidates in three waves. And so it's incremental growth. So the next move up will be another five waves, and the next decline will be another three waves. That gives you an idea of the trend, where the market is heading. So waves form on varying degrees because they're fractals. They're fractal in nature. So, you know, you can see the same development on a weekly chart as you can see on a 10-minute chart. So you can identify at varying degrees of trend or varying time frames what the trend is at a particular time. Is it moving in five waves or is it moving in three? And that gives you an idea of the bigger picture trend when you, the, you know, the fifth wave is the ending wave. So um, if you're at a larger degree, say you're looking at a weekly chart and you can see it's in the fifth wave, then you can narrow down to a daily and a four hourly chart to see if the direction is turning, momentum's changing. Um, so Elliott Wave on its own um, is difficult to trade, but when you couple it with what I call kind of building a body of evidence, which is you know using Fibonacci targets, Fibonacci retracements, um, combined with intermarket analysis, trend channels, and, and other forms of momentum indicators, so the third wave of a five-wave rally should be the strongest wave. So that's when your your MACD and your RSI and your momentum indicators will be at their peak. So what you're looking for is, say, for a fifth wave, you're looking for divergence in momentum. You're looking for um, the market to stop trending as strongly as it was in the past. Okay, and for you to actually trade... Elliott Wave, for you to actually trade the signals that Elliott Wave provides, uh, these have to align with your, your global macro views. Is that correct? So you're not just using uh, Elliott Wave in a sort of a systematic uh, kind of approach. Correct. I use it um, in terms of um, what my global macro view is and 
So I use Elliott Wave and I use a bunch of other technical indicators as really a um, – it's really for timing and timing the trade. That's what the difference is. Okay, okay. And where does this actually come from? Like who was Elliot? <laughs> Aaron Elliot. Um, he developed it oh, – I'm trying to think how many years ago it was. I think it was the 30s and 40s. Um, he – just based his theory on his observations and market observations. So he would plot um, daily charts of the price action of various um, commodities and so forth. So RN Elliott was the is the godfather of of Elliott Wave. It's named after him, and he published a bunch of articles around it uh, about his observations and his theories around the Elliott Wave process. And then Robert Prechter was the one. Uh, to really take it to the next level and to bring it to the mass market and publish the book, you know, The Elliott Wave Principle by Frost and Prechter. And that's been been published since the, I guess, the 80s. So he developed um, R and Elliott's work and added to it over time. And I think that's kind of what I refer to as the Bible, is the book, The Elliott Wave Principle. So that, that gives you all the foundation of the structure and the observations, the relationships, um, the rules and certain conditions around the different wave structures. Okay, so that's a book that can actually be purchased still today? Yes. Yep. Excellent. And what was the title of it again? Elliott Wave Principle okay. by Frost and Prechter. Right, right. Okay, and just before we move off this, from, from what you've seen, is Elliott Wave a more effective form of analysis in particular markets or on certain time frames than others? Um, from my perspective, it works on all time frames. It is more reliable, I think, on bigger picture time frames where you have less noise in the markets. So you can trade, and I have, you can trade a one-minute chart successfully using Elliott Wave. Like you can trade on dollar yen a one-minute chart, and you can trade that and make money. Um, what I find is you get more variability in the outcomes. So my experience has been the longer time frames give you more reliable results because you have additional, I guess, you have additional evidence. So you get a better idea of um, confirming signals. You get better idea of, you get more information. So you get the longer time frames um, are benefited by, you get to use intermarket analysis and you get less noise in the data. So to me, it works better at longer term than it does shorter term. Yeah, okay. Now, intermarket analysis, this is something you've, you've brought up a few times now. Can you walk us through how you actually go about that? Yeah, John Murphy is probably the guy who kind of created the best resource of intermarket analysis. Um, and it's really about identifying how interest rates, currencies, equities, and commodities all move together, and where the correlations are, where the confirmations are, until they're, until they're not correlated. So from my perspective, you can use it in both ways. You look for it confirming the price structure. So you're looking for, say, for example, I'm looking to short US bonds, right? When I want to do that, I want to make sure the US dollar is strong because that'll be a confirming indicator. If the, if the US dollar is weak, it gives me far less reliable signal. So it's about having confirming indicators for uh, the commodities you're trading or for the product you're trading. So the idea that the expectation that gold will keep going higher while the US dollar is getting stronger is a conflicting trade. And you want to minimize your conflicting trades. You want to be in the position that is supported by the most evidence. So in an ideal world where you have strong US dollar, rising bond yields, and declining gold, for, as, as an example. So you can use it in that way. Another way to use it is when you don't – I often use intermarket analysis to see where markets aren't confirming the moves. 
So say, or some may regard, you know, like Dow theory, for example, if S&P and the NASDAQ make a new high, but the Dow is lagging. So that lack of confirmation sometimes provides you an opportunity and insight to the relative strength of the market. So sometimes you look for when the markets aren't actually confirming each other. And that provides opportunity as well. And so if, if someone wants to find out more about into market analysis, um, are there any resources that you'd recommend? Uh, John Murphy's work, as I said, what's his, uh, I'm trying to think of oh, his main book, what was it called? I can I can dig it up and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, yeah, I can send it I can send it to you after this. But it's basically John Murphy is the is basically the godfather of uh, intermarket analysis. Okay, cool. Now, just moving on to your global macro uh, views, what are the key macro factors that influence your market views? Uh, at the moment, it's the Fed. It's the US Fed and followed by, not necessarily its order, the Chinese central banks, the Japanese central bank, um, the ECB and so forth. So the market over the last five, six years has been driven by liquidity, which has been driven by Fed decisions. And we have a, a world of zero interest rates or negative interest rates. And that is the absolute key driver in all market action. So you need to understand the Fed decisions. You need to understand how the relative Feds, are, and of most importance is the US being the biggest economy, the reserve currency, and understanding the Fed behavior and why they're doing what they're doing. So that to me is kind of the primary driver. Um, and there's a whole macro thesis around that, being in a world of too much debt and not enough economic growth, but the key driver right now is is the Fed, and that's why the markets tend to gyrate wildly around every Fed official and every Fed president coming out and having their two cents worth. Well, let's talk a little bit more specifically about your actual strategy, like getting into trades, how you're managing your risk, that type of thing. So um, one of the things I read on your website when I was doing a little bit of prep for this, uh, for our interview here, is you, you'd mentioned that you stagger entry orders. Could you expand a little bit on that? Sure. Now, in terms of how I go about trading, it's really starting with obviously doing your market analysis and you've got your macro view. So you do the market analysis, what the charts are telling you, where the opportunities are. And it's really about synthesizing those ob observations, which I think is a big difference rather than looking at a chart and trading that one chart. It's doing your work across a broad range of indicators and a broad range of markets, synthesizing that into a picture of where you think the markets and how the markets are positioned and therefore where the opportunities are. Are people long dollars, short dollars, are they long bonds, short bonds, equities and so forth and understanding what the market dynamics are. In terms of entering a trade, it's really about, so I look for, the way I do my analysis is looking for buy and sell zones. So where I think a market is turning or looking for a turn. So in terms of executing on that trade is at key decision points or key FIB targets, you enter the trade with more likely to be kind of a minimum entry point for me. And once I start getting confirmation of a turn and a move, I'll add to that position. So the staggered entry, the staggered, the whole concept of staggered entry is um, something taught to me by Richard Wiseman, who wrote the book Trade Like a Casino. And his idea, it's all about um, really about risk minimization and not missing the trade. Yeah. So the concept being. A staggered entry approach gives you, uh, if the market turns before your level or it turns after your level, is just making sure you are in the trade that you want to be in and so you don't miss the trade. Yeah, so it's minimizing uh, the chance of missing the opportunity. Okay. I've got to say that the title of that book has always fascinated me and got me really keen to read it, Trade Like a Casino. It's, um, <laughs> it's a great title. Is it a good book? It's a very good book. Um, I know Richard personally and he's an excellent trader. He, we trade very differently. 
um, but that doesn't decrease the value of the book. It's, you know, his ideas around trade like a casino are really about having the edge and trading your edge and basically being the casino and not the punter at the casino whose yeah. odds are always against them. So that's that's the basic philosophy of it. Yeah, I might have to check it out. Definitely should. <laughs> and and while we're talking about the the entries and getting into actually getting into the market, how do you decide what trades are going to be swing trades and what are going to be your macro sort of position trades? It's really about where the markets are at that point in time, and what what are the what's the risk reward? Where do I see the bigger picture trend? A good example is the US dollar right now in terms of identifying, I want it to be long, I want it to be long at the 94 level, I published that in my blog. Um, so you start staggering entries knowing that my expectation is that ultimately we get over 102. So that's that's the premise of the trade. So you have your, st- you have your staggered entry at the expected turning points and at your support zones. The idea is to get long and you add to it as the market confirms your move. So the idea of whether it's a, a bigger picture position trade or a swing trade is your expectation of the length of the trend or my expectation. So I'm looking for a trade from 94 to 102. Does it get much higher than that? I don't know, but that's all I need for my risk reward. Yeah. Okay. So in terms, and to me, that's a fifth wave move. So it's an ending move. So it's not a long term position. It's for me, it's a swing trade. So it's where you are in the bigger picture trend that defines whether it's a long term position trade or a swing trade. So in that instance, in my mind, it's a swing trade, trading off the daily charts or the or the four hourly charts. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Now that that definitely makes sense. And what are your rules or your conditions for adding to positions? Like when do you decide when to do it and when not to do it? Um, it's when I start seeing on a smaller degree, I start seeing impulsive rallies. It's an Elliott wave term. So I see a small degree five wave rally on say an hourly chart or a four hourly chart. So if I start to see confirming price action, the market starts to move in the direction I'm looking for in five waves and it's correcting in three waves, then I know that the bigger picture trend has changed and I can start to add to the position. Okay. And then I guess the last part of the puzzle, how do you determine your exit points? Um, The exit is basically where at the start of the trade, I kind of know where my entry, my risk and where my exit point because that's the only way you can figure out what your risk reward is. So my exits are predetermined. So I will exit probably 75% of the trade at my targets. And if it's still, if the momentum's still high and it's still working my direction, I will leave a small runner on. But I'll take the majority of my profits at my initial targets. And I establish those targets based on Elliott Wave rules and, and Fibonacci extensions and so forth. A lot of which I, I outline on, on my site. And, um, and on my weekly updates, which I publish. Yeah. Um, what is your website? It's marscapitalpartners.com. Okay. Yeah, I meant to mention a little bit earlier when we were talking about, you know, it'd be helpful if we had a visual aid. Um, I know you've got plenty of charts and examples on your website, so I meant to mention it back then, uh, marscapitalpartners.com. Uh, was there something you wanted to add there? No, I was just saying that's basically a weekly market update that I do before uh, the trading starts every week and it, and it gives you an idea of my thought process. So what I do is basically blog that every week. It's my thought process as to where I think the markets are, where they're heading and I cover you know US and global equities. I cover um, the major FX markets and commodity markets. So on that you can get a good read of kind of how I go about my thought process of actually executing trades and the patterns I'm looking for, uh, where I think we are in the varying degrees of trend. Um, I've been publishing that for about four years now, I think. So yeah, every week I usually post an update. And uh, that, that gives you an idea. And, and th- the idea is not to just look at the charts and read the actual words because that's really my thought process. And the reason I started that was really for a discipline reason for myself. Um, 
putting it out there, putting it out in the public press, you know, opens you up to critique, and I think that is a good thing. And um, yeah, it's a good discipline to have for me because that's writing the update is how I think, and it's the best way to um, articulate trades for myself. Actually, having it down on paper. Yeah, and actually, when I interviewed uh, Peter Brandt, he said a very similar thing uh, for himself. So no, I think um, I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't want to miss something you said uh, just before, and that's uh, when your when price hits your your target, like your profit target, uh, you generally take about seventy five percent of the trade off. How do you manage that final twenty five percent, and when do you finally uh, exit the remaining position? Um, the way I go about it is, once again, using uh, my, I guess, the technical analysis in terms of the Elliott wave completing a pattern, looking for a change of trend on a shorter term time frame. So if the price gets to my target and starts to reverse, or we have a reversal bar, or it starts to decline in five waves on a small degree, that's when I know the trend has changed once again. So you either reverse your position, or you just get out. So I, I look for kind of key reversals. So whether it's a, a daily key reversal bar chart or um, a candle. So I use a variety of indicators to see when I think the trend is ending. So I don't use formal trailing stops as such, but I wait for the trend to change. When I see the change in trend, that's when I get out of the rest of my position. Got it. Okay. Very good. Now, one last question. Uh, also, when I was snooping around your website, <laughs> I saw you mentioned um, trading checklist a few times as in that you use a trading checklist. What are some of the items on this list and you know, especially some of the items that you think might be beneficial uh, for, for anyone listening to this podcast to try and um, maybe add to their own checklist or, or take into consideration before placing a trade? There are a couple of things. There's one which is the checklist. It's another in terms of... Um, the trading process and to me probably helpful to just describe briefly my personal checklist so I start off the day and self analysis right so the first thing I do is meditation for about you know 15 20 minutes and it's really about are you in the right frame of mind to trade yeah do you feel do you feel good have you been well rested are you exercising how do you feel mentally yeah so the first thing I do every day is self-analysis and other people do it in different ways but it's basically prepping yourself mentally for the day. Um, second step I do is then go through my chart to do the market analysis and really kind of analyze what happened overnight. Um, being in Australia, I get to see what happens in the US overnight, um, what all the various markets are doing and then the step after that is synthesizing those observations, right? So, you know, are the bonds moving with the FX markets, are they, what are the equities doing? Are they doing their own thing? Are the commodity markets confirming or not? Um, so really synthesizing what you see. And then the next step is really expressing those observations into trading ideas. So where do you find, where do you see the risk, where do I see the risk reward opportunities for what the markets are doing? Are we setting up? Um, and then it's the next steps really kind of executing and managing the trades, which is a lot about stalking and waiting for the right entry and um, identifying the risk parameters, the targets and so forth. And I guess on the back of that is really action executing the trades and then finally kind of documenting and, and uh, journaling the day, basically a daily debriefing where I put all my trades on the spreadsheet, update them, journal them basically get a, a feel for how I did on the day. Did I follow my rules? Did I, you know, take the trades I wanted to take and so forth. So that's kind of the process I go through on a daily basis. Um, in terms of the traders checklist, it's really about, say I see a, an opportunity. So I, the checklist is one, you know, what's the macro thesis around it? Two, uh, what are the Elliott wave counts? Do, does the wave count and do the prices support my thesis? Are there specific trade triggers? So do we have a reversal bar? Do we have um, a clear you know, five-wave move on a, a short-term pattern? Um, 
then the next check part of the checklist is Fibonacci retracements and projections where you where I create a kind of target cluster and where support and resistance should be using trend channels, trend lines, um, RSI, MACD, which are on all my charts, just to see whether they're confirming the price patterns. And then I guess lastly is correlated markets. You know, are the, are the markets correlated or are they starting to diverge? That's, that's basically my checklist through the day for each trade. And how are you how are you keeping track of all this? Like what actual tools are you using for journaling and your your research and observations? Um, I, I journal just open, write it down. Um, I use my blog often for journaling in terms of um, identifying key market moves. I also physically print out my little traders checklist on every trade I do, and I print out the charts that I'm trading off just so that is you know, verifiable evidence of what I've done, the decisions I've made and why. I also use a, um, a, a basically a trading spreadsheet um, which has every trade, entries, exits, risk, um, reasons for the trade, reasons for entry, reasons for exit and so forth. So between the journal, between my blog, the checklist and the um, spreadsheet, you get a pretty good record of your behavior over time and that helps you over time to go back and review how you've been trading, review the decisions you made and how you executed. Excellent. Good stuff, man. Really, really good. So, where can listeners go to find out more about you? Basically, on MarsCapitalPartners.com, I have basically my weekly blog. It has a bit about me and my background. I've got a page there on my trading plan which effectively shows kind of um, how I go about executing trades, and that's that's basically the best place to go. Okay, and what about Twitter? Uh, yes, sorry, Twitter at trader underscore Mars. Dario, thank you very much for doing this, man. It's been a lot of fun and um, an absolute blast to have you on. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate being on, and, and I appreciate the service you've provided for everyone. It's uh, it's great to be able to hear other traders and how they go about their work and their perspectives. So thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Aaron. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.